the date. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, obviously myself, Roly, um, for those that don't know me, I've been with UBC for a few years and fortunate enough to get the academic lead position um, for the new Fraser cohort, which is really exciting. And um, Alison, I think who everybody knows is joining me tonight um, to answer any questions and go through some of the info with us tonight. So we really just wanted to, to, to give a bit of an update because we've been talking about the uh, site for a while now and PABC have sent out some emails about the site um, in the past. Um, so we're in a position where we can give you a little bit more insight into what things might potentially look like. And we also wanted to talk a little bit more about the role of the clinical skills assistant. Um, some of you may already be involved with UBC, but we recognize that for a lot of people that live and work out in Fraser, it's uh, quite the trek. So we wanted to talk about the roles um, that will be available at Fraser in the hope that you will bring some of your skills and expertise and share with our students um, at the site in Surrey. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves um, or pop some things in the chat and we will have some time for a Q&A at the end. And I hope not to keep you too long. I know many of you have, have worked, so we'll try and keep this, this short. So I just wanted to start with a, a land acknowledgement. So I am speaking to you today from Maple Ridge in the Fraser Valley, and this is where I like to call home. I acknowledge that I'm on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Kwantlen and Kansi First Nations, part of the Stolo group and of the peoples of the Coast Salish. And when I was reading more about the traditional lands and the people, it was interesting to see that when the uh, uh, when they were building the Golden Ears Bridge, which is about when I moved to Maple Ridge, um, that they discovered a lot of preserved artifacts, including a 3,600 year old wapado, which is similar to a potato and was a main food source of the, of the Katsi uh, nation. So really the purpose today is just to give you a bit of an upside, uh, up, update on our progress and the expansion. And again, go through the role of the clinical skills assistant and just provide some information on how to become a clinical skills assist assistant if you're not one already. And you just have to excuse my voice. I am unfortunately just getting over COVID and I've been left with a bit of a persistent cough. My son brought it home from school and uh, it's done the rounds. My little, there we go. So for those of you that don't know, the, the site's going to be located in City Centre 1. There's a couple of buildings opposite Surrey Memorial Hospital, and City Centre 1 is on 96th Avenue, just opposite the Surrey Hospital Old Emerge. So this is 96th Avenue here. The Old Emerge just used to be on this side here, and we are located um, just, or we will be located just opposite there in this wonderful new building. Now, I'll just get you to orientate to the building here a little bit. We will be eventually located in this first floor. And if you take note of this little class bit here, um, that will just help orientate you to some of the design plans that I can share with you as well. Um, so the site is going to be shared with our colleagues in occupational therapy. And we're going to have um, uh, set up similar to what we do at Friedman, but obviously on a smaller scale. So we'll have two learning plinth labs like we do at Friedman in 204 and 304. We'll have a dedicated lecture space for, for students to, to listen to didactic lectures. We'll also have a multi-purpose lab with a variety of exercise equipment in. We're going to have a research space for a faculty member. Some of you may have been attending some of the presentations by the uh, recent applicants for that position. We can have breakout rooms. So those of you that have been to Vancouver or studied at UBC down on the bottom floor of Friedman where the, where the students hang out and also when we run the exams and the OSCEs. So we'll have breakout rooms for the students there. And there's gonna be also space for a student led clinic there. And as we're not on a university campus, there's also um, kind of learning commons and areas for the students to hang out, have lunch, study, mingle on the site as well. 
And as well as that, we're going to have obviously office space for admin and faculty. And there's also going to be quite a bit of flex space. So if you're coming in to Fraser to do a guest lecture or you're coming into CSA, there will be some flex office space so you can sit down and find a computer and see some of the faculty and the staff as well. So this is what the floor plan um, looks like. So I don't know if, if uh, many of you are used to reading floor plans, but this, this will be, um, can everyone see my arrow? Yeah, so this is where people will arrive in the elevators. Okay, so just to orientate to the picture that I showed you before, this was kind of that glass front of the building when we were looking at the front. So this is the south side of the building here. And that's what we were looking at in that picture. So students, patients, staff will, will come up through this elevator lobby. And then to the north here is what's going to be the future, future student-led no. clinic. So this will be the student-led clinic. Um, so similar to what we have at Friedman. Um, we've got a large open space in there. There's a couple of um, dedicated closed rooms. There's a room for group therapy. Um, there are some curtained plinth areas, um, areas for some, some charting and perching for the students to hang out. And then if we come around into the academic space, if we turn around to the left and we walk south, this is where we're going to have our two main plinth labs. So these are like the Friedman 204 and the 304, the plinth rooms there. And again, like we do at uh, UBC Vancouver, we'll kind of have uh, one of the rooms dedicated for the first years and one of the rooms dedicated for the second years. And then this is where we've got a couple of breakout rooms here. So we'll have four breakout rooms for our physio students. I'll show you just the physio bit at the moment. As we keep strolling down here, this is where we're gonna have our uh, multi-purpose lab. So you can see there's room for some plinths in here, some exercise equipment, a large open space to run other labs where students can go and get other experience. And then over here is gonna be the area for the learning commons. It's gonna be a place where the students can hang out, microwaves and things like that, um, have their lunch. And then all along this front here, there's seating for students to kind of sit down, mingle, study. And then as we walk to the back here, um, this is where we're going to have all our kind of faculty and administration offices. And then we're going to have a large flex space at the back here. Now, I should just say that this is still as a draft. Um, so don't hold me to this as an exact plan. But I think this gives you a, a good representation of what the place um, may finally look like. And then just over here, we have our kind of two rooms where people uh, will receive uh, didactic type lectures. So they could either be in the lab, excuse me. <coughs> they could either be in the lab receiving lectures or they might be um, in, in the dedicated lecture room where the plinths aren't and they can sit around and everything's VC'd there as well. And then we have some washrooms and things like this and the staff lunch room at the back. And then the rest of the space that I haven't shown you will be a space for the occupational therapists. So for those of you that have a hard time looking at plans, this is a bit of a 3D model, which just gives a different view. So again, we've got the learning commons area around the front where the students can hang out and mingle and all those chairs along here. We've got the faculty offices and the flex space along the back. <coughs> excuse my coughing, the student-led clinic at the back here, um, our, our breakout rooms. And then I didn't show you on the other one, these are the dedicated research space. So we'll have um, space for either an OT researcher and the physio uh, researcher. They'll have their own lab space on site as well. So it's really exciting uh, to kind of see these designs come up and uh, kind of get a sense of where we all might be in, in the future. So as many of you may know, we're actually um, taking in 20 students for the Fraser cohort this year in 2022. So I think, Alison, you were saying that the students have just had their offer letters sent out. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of happy people there at the moment um, receiving their offers. But for the first year, the Fraser uh, students will actually be located at Vancouver um, and they won't be in Friedman. We're going to um, 
situate the Fraser students in the life building on the Vancouver campus. Um, obviously, Friedman is full. For those of you that are involved in the program, you'll notice um, that there's very um, little space to house 20 extra students. So for the first year, they will um, uh, do their studies at Vancouver. And then when we, the plan is that the space, we will transition to the space in uh, summer for 2023. Just have a look, we have a question here. Uh, a clap hands from Suman, thank you. So does anybody have any questions at the minute on the space or anything like that? That kind of was the update that uh, I wanted to share with you in terms of the space. And then what I wanted to do now was just speak to you a little bit about the role of the clinical skills system for those that haven't been involved in this role at UBC before. Okay, if anyone does, please pop them into the chat. I'm just gonna play this short video. Welcome to the Department of Physical <laughs> Therapy in Did the Medical hear that? Medicine at the University of British Columbia. Here in the Department of Physical Therapy, we train students to become leaders in the physical therapy profession. So at the MBT program at UBC, we instruct students in both lecture and laboratory settings. Typically, not always, there'll be a short lecture delivered at the beginning of a practical laboratory session. That would be the lead instructor doing that lecture. Sometimes as part of that, they'll do a demonstration and they might demonstrate the skill on a student or on another instructor. And that instructor might be a clinical skills assistant. And you can think about a clinical skills assistant as a teaching assistant who's in the room with the instructor in order to help provide feedback for the students throughout the laboratory session. These <coughs> clinical skills instructors or CSAs, they're clinical physiotherapists. And usually they'll come in in a class where they have clinical experience. I would say that as a CSA, my teaching, um, I am often facilitating the students that the instructor is the teacher in the classroom and they are instructing and, and having the main role as the teacher. So as a CSA, I'm just helping out. Once you're at the class, you're expected to support the learning of the students and support the instructor. Sometimes that looks like providing feedback to the students. Other times you may be involved in the examination process. So at the MBT program, like most physiotherapy schools, we examine students in practical examinations called OSCEs. And CSAs and instructors both can sit as an invigilator during these exams. CSAs are invaluable. They, 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 I, I, I teach and I show students how to find various structures. And then the only way to confirm whether the students are actually on the right structures and, and, are, and their hands are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing are my CSAs. With one instructor and 80 students, the most valuable thing is having CSAs circulating for when you're practicing those skills and you have those questions. So it's as though someone you can go to right away because it's you might not necessarily have the question the first time you see it demonstrated by an instructor. It's not till you get your hands on your classmates and you start practicing and you start having someone around you observing you that you realize, oh, I need someone to give me this instant feedback right now so that I can be a better practitioner. The first couple of years, I will admit uh, myself and some of the other CSAs, we definitely had to put in a bit more time into preparation, um, simply because, yes, we know our anatomy very well, but there are some minor details that might not be as clinically um, uh, relevant as some of the other ones. And so uh, we did have to go back and review some of that stuff. I think I felt fairly prepared 
to be a CSA, even though I only had two years of experience. Um, I think a lot of the information was quite fresh in my mind. A, a lot of the notes I had access to from um, when I was in school and in that in that same year. Um, and so I was able to go and review those things again. And it was, I think it because it's so fresh in my mind, it was actually quite natural for me to come in and start teaching th those same skills. Being a CSA is incredibly rewarding. It's so enjoyable to get to be part of the learning of the next generation of physiotherapists. Not only does it enhance the learning of the students by you being able to bring your clinical experience into the classroom and really creating that connection between classroom learning and clinical practice. But I found it also really helps enhance your own work as a physiotherapist. You know, there's been instances where students have asked a question that has changed my perception of my job. Um, I would say just go for it. It's awesome. Okay, I can see. Welcome to the Department of Physical there's a couple of questions. Let me just have a look. Oh, Alison, you've, you've answered them. Thank you. Yeah, so um, eventually 40 in the Fraser site, 20 in each year. Um, okay, thanks. Yes, hopefully looking forward to moving into a space for 2023, especially for myself with the uh, much easier commute to pop over the, the bridge into Surrey than the commute to, to UBC. Um, so just to give you an idea again on how this may look in the distributed site. So if, if you're keen to be a CSA in Fraser, there may be times where you are in a lab with another CSA in Surrey and the main lecturer may be in Vancouver or they may be in the north and their part of the lecture, the instructional part of the lecture would be broadcast to the other sites wherever the, the, the lead instructor isn't. And your role as the two CSAs would be to facilitate the learning in the room to go around and, and check the techniques. Now, most of the time what happens if you've never been a CSA before, the lead instructor will, will meet with you either over Zoom or share some slides with you. So you will have an idea going into the session what that lab will be, what the, the, the uh, learning objectives will be. And um, if you have any questions, you can, um, you know, discuss that with the instructor before. I still actually do some CSAing to help out my other uh, colleagues, and sometimes it's an area that isn't within my uh, skill set. And sometimes students ask me questions, and I defer to the instructor. And then sometimes I'm the instructor, and students ask me questions, and I defer to the CSA because the CSA is is currently clinically working and uh, may have a better sense of the current climate of things. So I think it's a real team effort, and the CSAs are really important in kind of um, bringing that kind of current input into the sessions and and uh, liaising with the instructor. Um, and there may be times where you are at Fraser. So for example, uh, some of the labs that I run, I have uh, uh, CSAs that assist in those labs, but I obviously would be lecturing from Fraser. So we'd have a CSA with me. And then the other sites would be uh, CSAs and we'd be broadcast into the different sites. Um, Alison, are you okay to speak? I'm gonna have a good cough a minute. <laughs> No problem. Did you want to, are you finished with this slide or do you want me to speak a bit more to this? Um, do you want to speak a little bit about uh, the kind of vision for the, the program yeah. now with the distributed sites? Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so, so nice to see you all here. Um, lots of names I recognize, some graduates, which is awesome. We are always thrilled to have our graduates come back. In fact, a couple of the folks in the video you just watched were um, graduates from our program. So it's really nice to see the graduates here, but also everyone else for, um, thank you for your interest. Um, so the, the kind of, you know, we've always been a VBC program. Um, UBC has been the only program uh, in BC, unlike some other provinces that have a, a number of different programs. So we've always had a BC focus, but um, that's predominantly been by through our clinical placement opportunities. 
so what's different in this distribution and with the distribution to the north at UNBC and Prince George and the distribution to the Fraser is that our learners are actually going to be on site in those locations learning um, the academic coursework in the program. So it still remains a, a UBC BC program and the learning that takes place is really influenced by the sites um, where the students are. So it can have some unique uh, um, contexts and unique experiences for the learners just because they're in different locations. Um, so I think Roly and, and the video described quite a bit about kind of the, the model of a, typically a, a lead instructor um, and CSAs across all the sites uh, to help support that learning. That's a model that we've used even when it was only a Vancouver site program. Um, there, it, <laughs> I was just going to say very quickly, Rolly, um, the, there's a focus on equivalency and, and, and according to accreditation um, policies, there, we, we have to deliver a substantially equivalent program to all of our learners. However, that doesn't mean that we can't have unique uh, experiences and contexts that happen at the different sites. And we see a, a big role in CSAs bringing those contexts to our learners. So that's really exciting. Okay, I'm good, Rolly. Perfect, so Rolly did not wanna to speak to this slide and I promise I won't go on at length though. I, I do really love the curriculum piece. Um, what we thought might be helpful for folks is to understand a bit about our program. It's a two-year program. Um, the, the model is that it moves from uh, um, uh, entry to practice, or sorry, from foundational to entry to practice over the course, it's a mix of different content areas and different uh, learning across the whole program. But because we're talking about clinical skills assistance um, and that role, most of those roles are associated with our clinical skills courses, which kind of makes sense. So those are the courses that have big labs in the plinth, in the plinth rooms um, where we need a lot of support and we bring in a lot of folks to help teach that and reinforce that to the students. So I just wanted to really briefly highlight typical times when those big courses happen. Um, certainly in the first two blocks of the course, so that's September to December, as Rolly's highlighting very nicely with his pointer. Uh, so that period has um, some uh, clinical skills content and across a couple of different courses, actually, where we bring CSAs in. There's also a really big um, clinical skills course in block B, which is a January to April time. Our students just wrote their and sat their exams last week for that one. And then the students go out on uh, two back-to-back -back clinical placements. That's that kind of green block in block C. They come back in a little bit in the summer. We don't have a lot of clinical skills courses happening through the summer because typically that's when a lot of people take vacation and it's really hard to, to bring people in for those times. Then they start up again, kind of end of August into the fall. And that's a really heavy clinical skills block. Uh, that's where Roly teaches a lot. Um, and that's where we need lots and lots of folks. So you'll see there's a bit of overlap between the block A um, and the block D. So the fall is a very busy time and really is where we probably have most of our CSAs um, coming in to help with the teaching. Then you'll see a series of green blocks as you move forward. Again, those are more clinical placement um, opportunities for courses. It's kind of more clinical placements are weighted toward the end of the program. And then they have in kind of May coming up soon for our final year students in May to June, uh, another clinical skills course. Um, so that's where we again bring in CSAs. So just wanted to give folks an overview. I, and I will just mention that I do know sometimes um, from people who come in to teach in a particular course, uh, people have questions about, oh gosh, what have they already learned or what are they, are they covering this somewhere else or how, you know, kind of trying to get a sense of where the, the teaching in that particular course sits. It's hard to go through every detail related to that, but I will say that you'll get a very good sense from your, the lead instructor, from the course coordinator, and please don't ever hesitate to reach out to Roly, who knows the program very well, myself, uh, if you do have questions like that, we're really happy to, um, to you know, provide information or, or fill in any blanks that you might have.
Thanks, Alison. Um, and I think as well, just speaking to um, to, the, to, the, to the role of the CSA as well is that the commitments vary vastly. So sometimes there'll be a, a call out for a CSA for one or two labs. Um, I would say on average, they're probably typically two to three hours per, per lab. Does that seem fair, Alison? But then sometimes the commitment is a little bit longer. We're looking for somebody once or twice a week for several weeks. Um, so the requirements to be a CSA, if you haven't CSA'd um, in the program before and are keen to um, help out and provide your skills and input for the students, the requirements obviously are registered physio, two years clinical experience and uh, a preference for PABC members uh, and the process really is that a, an instructor or a course coordinator will send out an email to our listserv with the opportunities. So for example, they'll send out, um, this is a topic area, these are the labs, these are the dates, this is the time commitment. Um, this is what we are hoping um, the experience of the CSA will be. And um, moving forward, those posts will also indicate whether they are a CSA role for Vancouver site or whether obviously it's a CSA role for a Fraser site, which will at the first year obviously be at Vancouver as well. So basically to um, be on the listserv, you just need to send your resume um, to the MPT admin at ubc.ca and just indicate in the email that you'd like to be on the listserv for the CSA callouts. And then any future um, callouts, you will get an email and you can reply. Typically what happens once you've been a CSA for a lab before, you're often invited back then. And that just allows the program to build some consistency and CSAs get more and more familiar with the program. And then sometimes what happens is if instructors have other requirements, if you've CSA'd a few times, you'll, you might be asked to, uh, to run the lab at times as well. So CSA, CSAs are reimbursed at $60 an hour. And, and there are some other roles as well that we do put out. Um, so that sometimes, again, lab instructors um, or course-based or case-based tutors as well. And um, the pay does differ slightly depending on the role. Does anyone have any questions about being a CSA? So I think really that's all we wanted to, to cover today. We'll let you get on with your evening. But before we go, um, we would just like to um, do a little plug for, for the other ways of being involved in the program. So if any of you aren't currently taking any students and wish to have your site registered um, as a place to take students, or if you have any uh, future opportunities to take students, you can reach out to Amy Ellis. Amy is the clinical education lead for the Fraser cohort, and she can provide you with more information. And I am sure all our clinical team would be really excited if there are any additional uh, placement opportunities. I think it's, um, you know, it's a nice way to to get uh, the physios and the Fraser more involved with the program with this site. And I'm really, really looking forward to uh, meeting more people and uh, working with, with some of you that I've worked with before. And we, if anyone has any questions for Alison or I, please, uh, please unmute or type in the chat, but that's the end of what we wanted to present today. And I really appreciate you coming to have a listen and your interest and I uh, yeah, look forward to working with you all again in the future. I'll just say a big thank you to um, I'm happy to stay on for a moment longer if, if people do have some questions for sure. Yeah, really, really exciting. We're, we're thrilled. Great. It doesn't look like anyone's got any questions. So thanks again for joining. I'm going to um, stop the recording and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all.